Hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Where we went be for our speaker today is definitely good morning because it's like 8.15 in California. And uh, we're very happy to host Conrad Aguilar. He visited us for three months when he was still a student. Now he is a serious researcher in California. And he will tell us a fascinating story about how topology fell and the modular Gromov house of propinquity. Conrad, the Zoom is yours. Take it away. Uh Thank you. Thank you, Piotr, for the invitation and the uh, introduction. Um, it's always nice to talk in my math uncle's seminar. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm glad you worked in the... Uh, <laughs> I've been wondering how to work in a uh, pun with the felt topology, so I'm glad you were able to uh, uh, successfully make a felt pun. But, uh, but yeah, let's see how topologies uh, fall, I guess. <laughs> um, so uh, we'll begin with, let's see, um, some history um, about non-commuted van logs of the gromov hauser distance. So in the late uh, 90s, early 2000s, Riefel introduced um, quantum metric spaces, motivated by work of Kahn. And um, and the first and, and the purpose of this was to introduce a non-commuted van log to the gromov hauser distance, denoted disk Q, uh, to establish results uh, arising from high energy physics literature, such as matrices being the n by n matrices slash fuzzy, fuzzy spheres converged to the sphere. Um, but a lot of progress has been, a lot of a lot of work has been done since then. Um, various people, David Kerr, Hanfing Lee, Wei Wu, to name to, be, to name only a few, uh, developed other non-commuted analogs to the Gromov Hauser distance to answer other questions. Um, but in 2013, uh, Latremier uh, developed a his own non-commuted analog to the Gromov Hauser distance called the Gromov Hauser propinquity uh, to not only capture algebraic structure of the Caesar algebra. But also more algebraic structures related to, re related to the Caesar algebra. So I'll say what I mean by that. But the idea was, um, so David Kerr, Hanfing Lee, and these others uh, answer the question about distance zero giving you a star isomorphism of the algebras. Um, but their constructions sort of left the category of Caesar algebras in a way, and um, uh, Latremere kind of kind of wanted to stick to the category of Caesar algebras so that he can study other algebraic structures. So. What I mean by that is that the first algebraic structure Latremer sought to capture aside from just the Caesar algebraic structure was also Hilbert Caesar modules. Um, and he accomplishes by introducing modular Gromov Hauser propinquity, which detects distance between and shows convergence results related to modules. Um, so again, sort of Latremer's approach was let me stay within as much as I can the category of Caesar algebras when dealing with these quantum metric spaces so that he can capture, you know module structure, group actions. So um, so as I mentioned here, this was only the beginning, the module. So he introduced the gromov hauser propinquity as a uh, non-commuter analog to the gromov hauser distance on quantum metric spaces, which are Caesar algebras. But he went on to say, OK, what about modules associated with Caesar algebras, group actions, um, and spectral triples? So this all recently culminated. Um, let me see this chat. No, no, it's from me. It's OK. OK. Um, this all recently culminated in a uh, in the spectral gromov hauser propinquity. So really nice results um, of Latremer. He, he introduced a distance between spectral triples, which actually captures some of the structure of spectral triples, establishes convergence of the uh, spectrum of the Dirac operator, and things like this. So, um, and, and this the spectral gromov hauser propinquity is built using the modular gromov hauser propinquity, things like this. So, so this was Latremer's initial purpose in 2013 to introduce his non commuter analog, and now it's led to some very nice uh, structures and results. Um, so, uh, but this story, this uh, this talk is about, like taking still a few steps back to the 2016. So the spectral propinquity was introduced back in, I think, uh, 2019, 2020, so that's more recent, but um, I was still, I'm still working on, I'm interested in more module structure, okay? so. Um, so when Latremer first introduced the modular propinquity, he used it to establish convergence of Heisenberg modules over the quantum two tori. Um, so, uh, however, in the process, he also in that same paper, in the paper where he introduces, I have references at the end. Um, he also established convergence of some standard standard modules related to Caesar algebra. So, if you think of some standard modules, you can think of finally generated free modules, direct sums of modules. Um, so he established that you know if you have Sort of convergence of the 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 base C star algebra, then any finally generated modules uh, under certain conditions converge as well in the modular propinquity. And also, if you have two uh, you know two modules, take the direct sum, 
and those converge in perpiquity, then the direct sums of them will converge too. Um, so in this talk, so the question that I that I sort of asked myself once once seeing this uh, this work of Lactromier was, well, another natural module associated with Caesar algebra or any algebra or any ring for that matter is uh, our ideals, right? Uh, ideals induce a module. So, um, and there is a natural topology on ideals, is the Fell topology. Um, it is built from the Jacobs the Jacobson topology on primitive ideals. So, I want to be clear that this result, the, this talk is about the set of all ideals of a Caesar algebra, uh, not just the uh, primitive ideals. So, um, you can sort of extend the Jacobson topology directly to a topology on all ideals. Uh, but Fell developed a different topology to do that, and um, and he did it for the purpose of uh, operate operator fields and developing results for that. So I sort of like to use more of a Fell topology. Um, also, Fell topology is always compact Hauser for any Caesar algebra, so it's a very nice structure. And if a if the Caesar algebra is separable, then it's also compact metrizable, so it's a very nice topology. Mm -hmm. um, so so yeah, so you know, Lachemire established some natural results of. And then some standard structures, I saw, oh, well, there's still, what about ideals, right? Ideals have natural convergence. What if they're associated with modules? What if I can, um, there's their associated modules also converge in modular propinquity. That's what um, the purpose, the motivation and idea for this work. And we were able to do this for unital AF algebras, equitative fitful tracial state and separable unitive, unital community procedure algebras. So, the, complex value continuous functions on a compact metric space. Um, so we established two examples. So in show, showing that if ideals converge in the felt topology and then their associated modules converge in the modular perpiquity. Um, okay, so <clears throat> however, the story begins with uh, quantum metric spaces. Um, so uh, so we'll start there and also introduce, introduce the gromov hauser propinquity, which was the non-commuter analog um, of the gromov hauser distance. I'll go into more detail of that, and then I'll sort of just state the theorem, the main theorem about the modular perpendicular and the main structures. Um, but uh, I sort of leave the the modular perpendicular is is um, the definition is quite involved. So I, I involve one of the main structures of it, which is the Gromov Hauser perpendicular, but the modular part. Um, that's um, the definition. This to I, I give a reference for it anyway. Um, it's quite involved, I think, for a talk. Um, okay, so the story starts with the quantum metric spaces. So how do we make a non-commutative analog to a metric space while well, we look at what are commutative metric spaces first, okay? Um, so what I mean by that is, uh, let's look at a compact metric space and see how we can capture that structure in C of X, um, the structure of the metric, uh, and make sure that we do it in a way that it's sort of living in the algebraic structure of the system algebra. So, Classical result, and this is part of Gelfin duality, is the topological structure of X. This is a piece of Gelfin duality, not all of it. Um, the topological structure of X can be captured by the state space. So, indeed, you can take the send X to its point evaluation or its Dirac point mass. Um, this gives you homeomorphism onto its image. Um, so, the topological structure of X can be captured in this the state space of this C star algebra. So. Um, however, if you want to sort of make a non-commutative analog to a metric space, I'd like to be able to capture a metric structure of X, right? X began as a metric space. However, to make any so sense I, of it. I, I think that the state space corresponds to all possible probability measures on X, not the X itself. Right, yes. Yeah. So, I, I, so I put here onto its image. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying that it's, yeah, sorry, I, I should have clarified. So it's a homeomorphism onto its image, which I'm mm -hmm. saying, which, which is the pure states. Yeah, I should have clarified. Okay. But th thank you for clarifying that. Uh -huh. Yeah. So yeah, it's not just homeomorphism, homeomorphism onto whatever its images, which are the pure states. Yeah. Um, there's several reasons we want to look at all the state space, in particular the state space for any unital C star algebra is compact. So um, whereas that's not true for the pure states um, for any unital C star algebra. Uh, so um, yeah, and there's several other reasons we want. So we want to discuss things about the whole state space. So thank you for uh, bringing that up. Um, anyway, we, to do this, we need a metric on the state space. If we want to get an isometry from X, D to into the state space, we need a, a metric first on the state. So one way to do this is um, at least the way Kantorovich, Rubinstein, um, F.E. Wasserstein also originally did this was let's look at uh, Lipschitz functions. So Lipschitz seminorm is defined as this. It's the 
supremum of the slopes of the function. Um, and of course, x shouldn't be equal to y. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I think yeah. that there is a question in the chat. Oh, sorry. Um, yes. Is this felt topology the same as felt topology in context of hyperspaces? Just when base space has an extra algebraic structure aside from necessary topological one. Um, I'm not entirely sure about that. So I do know that there are. So I should be clear about. Um, so the felt topology. So yeah, yeah. Thank you for bringing this up. Um, so Fell introduced. He did two things. He introduced. He said, if I take a topological space, any topological space. Mm -hmm. Uh, not just the primitive ideal space of a C square algebra. Mm -hmm. He said it developed topology on the closed subsets of any topological space. Um, so, so, and that's also called the felt topology. So people use the felt topology. So if someone just has a topological space and wants a topology on the closed subsets, so you view in the closed subsets of points, uh, felt introduced a topology for that purpose. Um, like it works for any space. However, in the context of Caesar algebras, and so I should be more clear in this, in the context of Caesar algebras, we're specific, the felt topology for the ideals of Caesar algebra is specifically the one built on closed subsets of the primitive ideal space with the Jacobson model. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and that's that works because there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between closed subsets of the Jacobson topology and ideals of non-closed two-sided ideals. So um, so yeah, so uh, yeah, so uh, likely. I'm not entirely sure about all the terms defined in this question, just because I'm, I'm not familiar with everything. <laughs> but, you, you, uh, you've answered my my question because it, it's just you know that the uh, space of all closed subset or of a topological space is in dynamical systems called the hyperspace. And I see. Th yes. th th that's why I use this this name. But yeah, you, you've answered my my yes. uh, question. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Oh, sorry, um, but just, just to be sure about this answer. So this is quite the same, but modulo this Gelfan correspondence, yes, between closed subsets and ideals, yes? Oh, yes, in the C of X, which we actually use for our proofs later. Yes, that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we okay. actually use that in the C of X case, the ideals are closed subsets. So the if X is a metric space, the Hauser distance between the closed subsets is the same as the felt topology on the closed subsets. It's actually mm -hmm. the same. Mm -hmm. Uh, which we actually used uh, for our proofs later on. Um, I don't have the proofs in the slides, but I'll mention that later on again. Um, yes. Um, so yeah, all, all inter interrelated, but um, but I did want to mention that there is this felt to foul introduced this topology for the purpose of operator fields, uh, but he just did a paper on the side said, oh wait, I just developed a topology for any and any set of closed subsets, the set of closed subsets of any topological space. Um, yeah, so um and then there's various ways to do this but like there's also the via torus topology there's other ways to do this um, but the felt topology is particularly works well with the cc algebraic structure um, when applied to primitive ideals uh, to get a topology for all ideals um <clears throat> okay um yeah so uh so the metric uh that captures uh, so you can use the Lipschitz semi-norm to capture the metric on this on the X using this metric on the state space called the Vonj Kantorovich metric. Um, so here's uh, some of the results from Kantorovich. Uh, this is a paper from the 50s or 60s, I believe, or 40s maybe. Um, uh, and I mean, some of these are just attributed to Kantorovich, not directly uh, from the paper, but uh, essentially he showed it metrized the states of the weak set topology. Anyway, so this is just a repetition from the previous slide up here. Um, and so, yeah, so the results are, so here are some results just about the algebraic structure. For example, the domain of this Lipschitz seminorm is dense, uh, meaning the elements for which it's finite forms a dense subalgebra, uh, star subalgebra, in fact. And uh, it's only zero on the constant functions um, as well. Furthermore, we do get this, what we've been looking for an isometry. So we capture X entirely in the state space of C of X, which is good news because any C algebra has a state space. Um, so maybe we can make a non-commutative analog. Um, and where delta sub X is the direct point of the point evaluation. Um, furthermore, we like to have the same topology on the whole space. Cause again, the idea is that 
right now we're kind of just looking at this in pure states, but again, pure states aren't really well behaved for any two-star algebra. So we want to sort of, you know, what do we need on all states? Well, we'd like this thing to neutralize the loose topology. And in the classical case, it does, which is good, which is what two is saying. Um, and there's this algebraic structure as well. The um, the LD satisfies, the Lipschitz seminar satisfies the Leibniz rule. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so then Riefel introduced the first motivated by work of Kahn because there's also a Kahn metric in a spectral triple case, but Riefel um, uh, looked to do this for more general structures, aside from structures coming from spectral triples, um, and introduced this in 1998. Um, there's variations of this. Um, for example, here I use um, order unit space structure here. Um, so usually you look at the C-star algebra, I guess the, yeah, there is a typo here. Um, we want to look at Z-star algebras, um, and in particular, uh, but Riefel introduced this more generally on any, um, not just any order, order unit space, on more general structure than that. Um, so Riefel in the 1999 paper and you know, 2000 paper, I believe, then formalized it in terms of order unit spaces. But in general, if A is this unital C-star algebra, which is what should be here, if A is unital C-star algebra, you want to look at the order unit space of self adjoint elements. Um, so here's the way we're looking at the self adjoint elements. Um, okay, so, and, and basically this has just some properties on the previous slide. Um, for example, we want to only vanish on the scale of multiple identity, the like constant functions, right? So this is the non-commutative idea of a constant function is a scale of multiples of the identity. Um, and we also want the domain to be dense um, in in this self adjoint elements, and we'd like the uh, this metric to metrize the weak star topology. Um, and in fact, density is enough to give this to make this an extended metric, meaning distance zero does give you the same states, but it can have value infinity. Um, but it's your density and this condition is not enough to give you metrization of weak star topology. So you do have to add that as part of the axioms. Well, May I sense. ask you a completely dummy question? Oh, no. uh, so what would happen if in this definition you would take not just self of joints, but the wider class of elements of your... So you could define uh, just on all the, the whole, again, this yeah. should be unitless Easter algebra. Um, but in that case, uh, you, you want to add maybe some other conditions, like uh -huh. for example, you would want L to be star preserving or, or, okay. or not okay. star preserving, but okay. star vanishing. Okay. L of A star is equal to L of A, yeah. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, so uh, one sort of connection uh, to connect it back to the to the, the classical case is that Riefel showed um, for any element in the domain, it holds that you can actually recover this abstract uh, semi-norm from a Lipschitz constant. Um, you can embed A into by point evaluation into the continuous state space. Um, so this is just you know. Uh, one connection, and then this was used to actually prove other equivalences for metrization of weak star topology, which are very useful for proving some things of quantum metric space. Um, so this is just, I like to give one fact that shows how it's um, sort of capturing this classical structure as well um, in the picture. Yeah, which also helps prove results in a non-commutative non setting. <sighs> Okay, so what about, um, again, this should be a unital Caesar algebra um, for our setting here. Um, what about the multiplicative structure, right? We've restricted ourselves to subordinate elements. Um, how are we going to capture any multiplicative structure? Um, well, the idea then is you want to sort of have a sort of Leibniz rule, okay? Um, and actually, I, th I believe uh, David Kerr was the first one to sort of generalize this notion of a Leibniz rule to something called F Leibniz. Um, so the idea is, again, this is just a, a generalized version and a version that works for self adjoint elements of this here, the Leibniz rule. So, I mean, it looks very strange what I just showed you on the slide, and I'll go back to it, but this is basically a generalized version of that to allow for different structures. And there are strange l semi norms that don't satisfy, like, an example we look at in this talk, um, the l semi norm. there's like a two- there's two in front of uh, the whole expression. So, sorry, um, why why it is called Leibniz? Uh, since you don't have an equality, it's not like a derivation; it's just an inequality. So, right. So, but but, but so it's so the idea is it's more of a uh, historical nod. That's why it's called the Leibniz rule. But you're right; it's not an equality. And also, those are semi norms. So again, I mean, maybe you would expect an equality as well, but. Um, 
it's it's more of a um yeah but the formula looks like it's like so that's yeah yeah and like and if you actually had um if x was like uh the closed interval zero one i mean here you'd have you can show that on uh at least c infinity you know i think c2 is good enough you can show on c2 the l semi norm is the norm of the derivative um the supremum norm of the derivative so in that case literally ah, like, okay okay that's true, it's getting, that's true. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I know how to make adam happy you could call it a sub leibniz rule sub leibniz okay <laughs> like <laughs> if you have sub -Leibniz. Sub -Leibniz. yeah so yeah. i guess here i guess david kerr's solution was called f leibniz i guess uh, mm -hmm. i don't know what f was for but uh, <laughs> uh you ran out of letters but um um yeah so it's f so yeah you're right maybe even the other one in the classical case should be called something like f or quasi leibniz um on the other hand it's ludwig i protest against denoting anti-commutator a b minus b a the commutator divided by two i this is an you, official you, protest i understand there's official yes. protest is it this is the two i well even with two i <laughs> <laughs> okay Anyway, but uh, yeah, so so uh, so. so what, 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 uh, well, thank you for your protest. Um, <laughs> for, um, this is uh, uh, so legal analysis. access will follow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. To protect myself, I'll um, I'll I'll state where this came from. So this is well, I guess. Um, so lot lot lots from here calls this the Jordan product and this the Lee product, which maybe mm -hmm. have even more protest for um, mm -hmm. calling this the Lee product, but. Uh, <laughs> So essentially, we want um, the domain to be a Jordan Lee subalgebra of the self evident elements. Um, and we want it to be a domain from a nice inequality with respect to something that gives us. Um, so all these conditions are just to give us a sort of quasi Leibniz rule. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> okay. So, so this captures the, so this is how we do, you know, we have to restrict the sub elements because there's various reasons, but some of the theory works well. And and then, I mean, people do this on all the CC algebras, but in particular for the work that Latremere has done and which is what we're building our work on here with the modular propinquity, um, it works well with the sub elements, um, but there's still an answer to capture multiplicative structure. So that's fine. Um, <clears throat> okay, so. Here are just a list of examples. I mean, I need to update this uh, more. I mean, it's, it's more and more examples. Um, Sorry, so, another legal protest. Yes. You misspelled Dombrowski here. Oh, no. Oh, oh yes, I forgot the... Um, yeah, very slight, very slight. But Potlash <laughs> is correct, so... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I will fix that in... Um, We'll edit it uh, from the recording. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, so the first, uh, so in Riefel's uh, paper in 1998, when he first introduced the idea of a quantum metric space, which it wasn't even called that at the time, um, he proved that the non commutatori the quantum tori, satisfy this. Uh, there's not curve non commutatori These are just, again, various examples. This is not a full list. Uh, group Seastra algebras, hyperbolic group Seastra algebras, also uh, Kristen Riefel. Um, introduced no potent group C algebras, AF algebras, which is the focus of this talk. Uh, Antonis and Christensen were the first to do this with the spectral triple, and with Latremere and I did it uh, various times in other years. Non commuted solenoids, the standard quantum polar sphere by uh, Jens Kahn and I. Um, and this was this was actually built from the spectral uh, Dombrowski Sotar's spectral triple. Um, uh, with the correct spelling. Um, that's some point um <laughs> so um yeah so i should so i do mention this here to to, to let us know that um i don't have the written on the slide but a, a, a candidate for these l semi norms um are conference spectral triples so it's the norms of the bounded commutators um uh gives us a semi norm and if it satisfies all the conditions of a quantum metric space then that gives us so that's that's a usual place to look for um uh, these L semi norms and quantum metrics. Um, and, and in this case, um, this case was first uh, somewhat studied by Kahn before Rifo generalizes to more structure. And then Rifo also introduced the um, the non commuted analog to quantum. So Rifo was the first to introduce the non commuted well, quantum metric spaces and the non commuted analog to the Gromov Hauser distance. Um, yeah, so whenever um, 
Yeah. So here, well, here's an here's the example, the AF algebra example, just to get, and this is relevant to the stock. Um, if I have a unitary AF algebra, I put the fatal social state. I can then construct a unique top observing conditional expectation onto each a n. And then if I take a sequence conversion to zero, and here the F Leibniz satisfies this property. Um, so you see, it's kind of like a Leibniz rule here, but it'll have a two in the front. Um, and if we define this, so this the, basically the structure of this is just to control how far your elements are from the subalgebras. Um, <clears throat> so if, if you let, and the beta, was that a question? Yeah. And it, so the beta sequence going to zero allows us, to, is what gives us that the uh, state space is metrizable in the weak start topology. Um, so, and that's all that's required is just the sequence converting to zero, a positive sequence. So you can take, for example, the reciprocals of the dimension, if this is infinite dimensional, if the A is infinite dimensional, if these are finite dimensional, then the reciprocal of the dimension of the rule converts to zero. So you, you not only get A is a quantum metric AL, but you also get A and L for all of them. Um, yeah, so this is just, an, and again, you need a metrizable weak start topology. So it does, it does reduce to uh, showing certain subsets of your C-style. For example, it reduces to showing that the, uh, the L-seminorm one ball um, quotient by the scalars is compact. Because um, remember, this is zero on the scalars, so uh, that's a, scalars is a non-compact set. Uh, but if you quotient by them and you can show the uh, quotient of the unit ball, of the L-semi norm is compact, then um, that's another way to show you, we, you metrize the weak-star topology. Um, so maybe that gives you a little more hint of why you need the beta sequence going to zero. <laughs> okay, so, um, but, uh, so um, now let's discuss how to take distances between these two um, uh, structures. Okay, so we have these, so again, it, we sort of follow the same sort of philosophy is that um, you know to introduce a non-commutative analog to a metric space? Look at the commutative case, right? Uh, and if I want to choose a non-commutative analog to the Gromov-Hauser distance, we look at the classical case, right? Gromov-Hauser distance was a distance between compact metric spaces. Uh, so we just have a little summary of the construction here, and then again we we're going to adhere to Gelfand duality to get an idea of what we should do in the non-commutative case. And so the summary here is that. Uh, if you take any two compact metric spaces, there exists many metrics on the disjoint union of the two sets, such that the inclusion mapping, mappings are isometries. So here's the picture that comes along with it. Um, and uh, we call this an admissible metric on the disjoint union. So in fact, the gromov hauser distance only requires admissible semi-metrics. But the idea is that there could be many metrics on the disjoint union for which these are isometries. And the gromov hauser distance says, OK, I really want, you know, if we want to show a distance between spaces, I want uh, distance zero to mean that they're the same, right? So, um, <clears throat> yes. So the and semi-metric uh, means that uh, what the zero condition is missing? What, yeah, what? the zero condition. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah if they're okay. the same, yeah. You saw if they're the same, it's zero. But if it's equal to zero, you don't have to be the same. Yeah. yeah. You don't have to be equal, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea is, well, then, then you can embed these and take the Hauser distance on whatever admissible mm -hmm. set. Mm -hmm. um, and what's nice is distance zero gives you a surjective isometry between this. So this is also a complete metric um, on the set of comp on the class of compact metric spaces. <clears throat> okay, so um, the idea then is, well, we want to sort of get at when two so. Some kind of kind of balance back and forth. We want to show so here, these two, this the classical case, the ground positive distance is zero, as I just said, if and only if there's a subjective isometry. So before we even build a non-commutative analog to ground positive distance, we should uh, define or 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 have a goal for what distance zero should be between quantum metric spaces. Um, so it turns out the. Uh, definition that makes the most sense um, is that you want two quantum metric spaces to be something called quantum isometric. If there's a star isomorphism, so the idea is you have two structures happening, you have the C algebraic structure and the other the metric on the state space. So it makes sense that if you want distance, you want things to be the same, um, uh, you would want a, the C star algebras to be quote unquote the same and you want the state space. So meaning you want a star isomorphism between the C star algebras but you want to be a little careful. You don't just want an isometry between the state spaces. You actually want your dual map 
which just composes the states with the uh, isomorphism. You want that to be your isometry. Um, again, this is natural, but um, one way to check that this is a natural condition is that Rufo also show that um, that two spaces are quantum isometric if and only if there exists a star isomorphism that intertwines the lip norms. So what's nice is that, I mean, again, this is maybe what you would naturally define it as, but furthermore, it's even nicer because you get this sort of categorical flavor of, of and also this is this, these conditions are only with respect to the um, two-star algebra structure. The, the um, like there's no state space mentioned here. So Tomai, you have a question? Yes, I have a question about this definition. Yes. Uh, is it true that uh, this uh, quantum isometry induces um, an isometry between uh, external points, the pure states? Uh, between the pure states. Is there um, a relationship between um, I believe so. of the state and no? Uh, maybe, I mean, uh, so pi star induces an affine map. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe, mm -hmm. yeah, so then an the affine map preserves. Uh, if I recall, does it preserve extreme points, affine maps? I forget. Yes. But the yes. pure state, yeah, the pure states are the extreme points. So, yeah. Uh, Modular some, maybe topological assumptions. Yeah, maybe top, yeah, yeah. Um, um, but I have to okay. confirm for sure, but uh, that, yeah, I think I've seen that before. Um, Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, but as I mentioned earlier, pure states, um, again, we want to sort of have these compact structures. So like we want so we want to use the state space uh, versus the pure states because there are, um, I believe there are even some C-star algebras non-commuter spaces. Again, the pure states for commutative, so uh, unital commutative is um, our compact, but uh, there are non-commuter spaces where um, pure states are dense. I believe that's a non-commuter tori. I don't know if someone, can, someone can correct me, but I think the, the non-commuter tori, the pure states are dense. So like, they're almost like the worst thing you'd want. <laughs> so um, almost the furthest from being compact. Um, so in a way, uh, so yeah, uh, okay. So now we have an idea for what it means for two spaces to be what we're so really, want. I, I guess. had a question regarding this remark. So you are claiming that for a non-commutative torus, the space of pure states is dense in this space of all states, yes? Is, is, yeah, is that, so, uh, yeah, I was asking if someone could correct me on that. Is that correct? Is that, is it the two quantum two tor? I, I, I feel like there wasn't a, maybe the irrational, sorry, maybe I think it might be, Again, I have to check this, but um, I think the rational rotation algebra. Uh, this is okay. so the case the quantum two tori when the um. And do you remember when one can find this result? Uh, I'm not sure where, but I I'd, I'd have to look and do um, where exactly one could it's, find. It's it. very interesting. Yeah, yeah, I, but I guess uh, what I'm trying to say in general is just there are very unwieldy pure state spaces um so yes, why yes, we, yes. we want to look at the state space yeah yeah <clears throat> okay thank you um all right so now we have a goal for when we create this non-commutative analog to the ground files of distance we have a goal for um what distance zero should be distance zero should give us this condition the star isomorphism yeah um so uh so let's see how to go from the graph as our distance sort of non-commuter version so again we adhere to Gelfand duality the idea is um we see that from Gelfand duality we get we switch the arrows right we get continuous functions on the additional union and then we now have surjections right so maybe the non-commutative case the idea is that we don't want to embed are to we don't embed our Caesar algebras into a bigger space. We actually want to look at a space that surjects onto our mm -hmm. Caesar. Um, and then you know these are uh, unital star homomorphisms, surjective unital star homomorphisms. So this gives us a clue into the following construction. Uh, we can chase this a little further though, um, because there might be, you know, what would be a candidate, for example, for this Caesar algebra that in the non-commutative case? Well, the continuous function of this union mm -hmm. is just some. So these are just further details. Uh, but the next definition doesn't require um, the space to be the direct sum. Uh, you really just are curious. You really just want a, a space that surjects on to both of them. Um, so yeah, and then if you get this, you also get in turn, so remember we want to be able to compare things on the state spaces. Uh, these surjections uh, induce 
their dual maps into cytometries of the state spaces. So this is so going two levels up, we basically capture back the picture, this picture in the classical setting. So therefore defending like, okay, why are we look? I mean, Gelfin duality is telling us to look at surjections, but we do in the end induce back injections from the two and two spaces, two metric compact metric spaces into a third uh, metric space here. Um, Again, so this this uh, motivates the following definition, uh, first introduced by Riefel and then uh, uh, generalized and tweak, generalized and specified. Um, so Latremay, um, the Riefel, when you first introduced the notion, um, and it was, I believe, called the bridge at the time, um, uh, he looked into uh, direct sums only. So Latremay allowed, it doesn't have to be direct sum. And also Latremay specified to the, uh, C algebraic setting. Um, so that was the the, the tweaks Latremere made. Uh, and then yeah, and then what's nice is that due to Riefel, back when uh, he was introducing these things, we do have the same structure here in the sense we have isometries into the state spaces, from the state space of this into the bigger state space here. So the idea is maybe then we can we sort of copy what uh, Gromov had done with the Gromov Hauser distance. So, sorry, this D is an element in E, yes? Not to be confused uh, yes. with any metric, yes? It's an element in the system. Oh, yeah, yes. In this case, yeah, the D is just an element. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the, the quotient uh, semi mm -hmm. construction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I guess I didn't want to confuse it with a identity element of a group, but then I found another way to make it confusing. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, that's an element of capital E. Um, so from here, uh, Latremere, um, so the, the issue is that then you may want to say, okay, I have isometries into this big state space. Why not just copy what Gromov did and just do the Hauser distance between the images of the S of J, S of A1 and S of A2. Um, however, certain issues arise. For example, if you try to do this, what I just did directly, you'll get that you end up creating something that's not a metric. So to fix this, uh, we've uh, largely introduced um, this quantity. So one quantity, again, the quantity you may think you sh quote unquote should do is, oh, let me just do the Hauser distance between the image of this and the image of this, right? Because that's sort of how directly the um, from the Hauser distance is built, right? Uh, but Lachman may realize that in doing that, he will wasn't able to get the triangle inequality. So sort of he made a quantity that sort of kind of tucked in the triangle inequality in the quantity. Like you're kind of being able to travel between spaces because you're going up to one first and then up to another one and then comparing those values here. So this sort of is the natural way to sort of get the triangle inequality to work out. And the paper where he proves this is actually called the triangle inequality and the Gromov Hauser propinquity. <laughs> so it's, it's like this sole purpose was to answer the issue of the triangle inequality. Um, so yeah, like I said, so if, if the quantity wasn't this thing, if the quantity was just a Hauser distance of this set and this set, then you'd run into issues with the triangle inequality. Mm -hmm. um, I forget the technical details of that, but um, so, so uh, Conrad, so I should think about this tunnel as having as boundaries A and B, right? So it's a tunnel from A to B. A and B sit sort of as a, at the boundaries of yes, uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay. and uh, yeah, and like uh, the tunnel it's, itself is the the, the tunnel, yeah. So yeah, A and B yeah, this is the, the east space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. so it is yeah. something like a cobordism, yes. <laughs> exactly, yes. Yes. Right. Yeah, I believe I, I I gave a talk recently and somebody brought up a I forget the term, but there's there's a term that comes from category theory that is related to this idea. So that may be another sort of connection to uh where this notion of going like up and then up to the bigger space and then do comparisons there and um, I forget the term off the top of my head, but anyway. Um, okay, but this was the answer to the triangle inequality. And then from this, uh, Latremere introduced the Gromov Hauser probability between two F Leibniz spaces, quantum metric spaces, <clears throat> to be in a femum of the extents. This ends up being a complete uh, metric for a fixed F. So, in fact, the if you have, so if you just look at the class for any F, you know, F was this sort of Leibniz rule um, thing. 
So it's a, it's a metric up to these mm -hmm. uh, quantum isometry for the class of, for any F. I take for all F, all F, F, G, whatever, <laughs> any F, uh, the, um, you get a, uh, it is a metric and the distance give you quantum isometries, meaning I sorry, some morphisms whose dual maps are isometry. However, if you want to be complete, that's where you have to fix an F. So it's complete. So fix an F function that gives you the Leibniz property. Fix that, then it's complete on all F Leibniz quantum compact metric spaces. So you have to be careful with them. And this is why Kerr first introduced this F Leibniz property was to get a completeness result. Because um, he, he realized that you had to sort of control this multiplicative property to get completeness, um, <clears throat> meaning Cauchy's, Cauchy sequences converge. Um, and uh, uh, and what's nice is that it um, so uh, what's nice is that also when Riefel introduced his own uh, quantum ground hazard distance, he also showed this fact for his quantum ground hazard distance, which is that uh, it is a non commutative analog of the ground hazard distance in the sense that it captures the ground hazard distance space over compact metric spaces. Um, mm -hmm. Does he get a homeomorphism? Yes, Tomac? Yeah. Yes, I have a question. Uh, could you remind me an example of a uh, star isomorphism whose dual map is not necessarily an isometry of the state space spaces? Mm -hmm. Good question. That is a very good question. I've actually not. Uh, but you are sure it's possible? Yes. Um... Yes, and I think there might be examples of, you know, there might be actually some simple, like take a three point space or something um, and look at the, uh, mm -hmm. like a classical oh, space, like C of three points. Right? I think there might be, I think it might be, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I haven't thought about that. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, anyway, yeah. Maybe uh, simply identity as the isomorphism and the different, Else, exactly. Yes. My norms. Yes. Yes. Different else. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think. Yeah. I think um, is right. Yes. So you allow different else here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so maybe just look at one single C star algebra and two different two different else and maybe. Yeah. That would be a way to show. And maybe the identity. Map, maybe you can just use the identity map in some way. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that in. In the commutative case, the star isomorphism at the level of sister algebras corresponds to just plainly homeomorphism. So, so just taking any homeomorphism, with, which is not an isometry, already on the level of pure states, and it is. Uh, oh, so so in that case, you do get uh, with respect to the Lipschitz seminorm, you do get um, the dual map is an isometry. With respect to the if you the L's you're using are the uh, Lipschitz seminorms. Um, in that case, uh, yes, but you can take just uh, take the the same sister algebras, just one C of X, and consider an automorphism of X, which is okay. far from being isometry. Yes, which is far from being isometry. Some I see. some homeomorphism into itself. So, right. Okay, I see. Yeah. I see. Ah, oh, okay, okay, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um. Okay. Um, yeah, so this... Uh... May, may, may I ask uh, more questions? Uh, if you have this isometry of the state space spaces mm -hmm. uh, on star isomorphic algebras, can you say then that L is preserved by this map? Uh, yes, yes, this was... Um, here. The, the Riefel proved, right here. Riefel proved yeah. that... Uh, oh, yes. oh, yes, 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 yes. Thank okay. you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. No, this is this is an important result. And this is equivalent. If it don't leave, okay. If it don't leave, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, 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 thank you. Then, yeah. So I, I didn't stress this enough. So thank, thank you for uh, bringing it up. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So yeah. So here's an example of convergence. Of quantum back to our AF case again. Many there's just many examples of convergence. Could, could we go back to the previous slide for a moment? Uh, yes. Um, uh, yes. So this mapping which sends the 
x uh, with d, a metric space to c of x and this Lipschitz seminorm is a homeomorphism to its image. It, as far as I know, it is not uh, in general an isometry, yes, that's correct. Right. Um, it's one Lipschitz. Um, so it's Lipschitz, like this map is Lipschitz with respect to so meaning the... Lipschitz, yes. And how about the uh, the inverse map from this image? It is also Lipschitz. Uh, no, and this is actually proven by uh, Hank Feng Lee. It's in a it's in a it's in an appendix. Um, a oh. brief paper on the uh, so if you look at Gromov Hauser distance uh, for quantum metric spaces. This is Riefel's two thousand paper. Uh, he has an an appendix by Hank Feng Lee, uh, which shows that the reverse map is not Lipschitz. Yeah, the inverse map is not. Yeah. Okay, and still I would like to ask the following. So if this map. Uh... Going the one way around this Lipschitz, then it is uniformly continuous. And you can ask uh, the same thing for this inverse maps from its image. Uh, I see. It's also uniformly continuous, which is much weaker than being Lipschitz, but, but right. still it's something uh, stronger than being just only continuous map. Do right. you know the so, other Um Yeah, I don't know anything about that result. That's a good question, though. Yeah, I don't know yeah. if it's. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, so just an example again that's relevant for this talk is that um, sort of this is kind of why we built the so for an AF algebra with fifth of trace of state. Kind of the reason we built this else seminar was again to capture how far the A ends are, and this accomplishes it well enough that we actually get convergence in um, the quantum grouping, uh, the dual propinquity, the ground power of propinquity. Um, here and in fact, I mean, we get something even stronger here in the sense that it's um, we know how fast it's converging uh, with an upper bound. So this is you can actually so for each n, this quantity is less than equal to the beta of n. So um, and that's actually important for other results that we prove. So in this paper with Matrimonia in 2015, we also proved some convergence of AF algebras, not just convergence of the finite dimensional, but the convergence you know take a sequence of infinite infinite dimensional AF algebras. For example, UHF algebras or um, the Afro-Shen algebras, um, which were used to prove, um, to classify the irrational notation algebras with respect to the rational parameter. So Pimzer and Wojcicki used the um, K theory of the Afro-Shen algebras to prove this. Anyway, Afro-Shen algebras are built from an irrational parameter. So we also show that if the irrational parameter converges, then the AF algebras converge. So, and because we had a controlled convergence of the finite dimensional bits, the finite dimensional uh, bits or pieces, um, we can get some sort of, we can get some, we can boost up the convergence to the, the whole AF algebra. So. I, I'm sorry, but I'm confused by your last sentence. If we uh -huh. define blah, 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 then A, L, and N for all our F Leibniz comp, aha, uh -huh, okay, sorry, I've got it now, sorry. Okay. Okay, yeah, such that. Uh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, and as I mentioned, this is mm -hmm. less than equal to beta of n, beta n goes to zero. So yeah, that's the exact calculation that gets us the limit going to zero. <clears throat> okay. Um, but again, our goal is to show that, for example, if I have a sequence of ideals, like fix an A of algebra, if I have a sequence of ideals converging in the Thel topology, as modules, do they converge in the module propinquity? Well, first we need to develop the notion of, and this is why this section has been called quantum vector bundles. So we had to go from quantum metric spaces now to quantum vector bundles um, to, you know, what is the structure to, um, so again, so now we wanna get a sort of quantum metric structure on modules, Hilbert Schuster modules, so that we can show modules converge, right? So um, the next slide is, well, modules have a lot more multiplicative structure to take care of. So um, before we even define what a quantum vector bundle is, um, uh, we have to define these extra. And so it's not just F Leibniz, it's, it's FGH Leibniz for now with these other things. Again, this is just a technical slide. It's not really, it's just showing you, I just want to show you that yes, like because there's module structures more in some way, more multiplicative structure behind the scenes. Not behind the scenes in the definition, um, 
it makes sense that we're going to need other sort of Leibniz module properties to capture those structures. So that's what these FGH are. Don't really have to remember, you don't really have to remember the definition. Just again, this is more of a statement. This, this slide is a statement, not really a, uh, it's to make a statement, not really to memorize a definition. Um, okay, so then with this, uh, Latcher may introduce the following quantum version of a vector bundle of a vector bundle uh, for uh, modules. Okay, so we say omega. This thing's a quantum metrized metrized quantum vector bundle uh, that has this data where uh, m with this inner product is your Hilbert C-star module, um, a left Hilbert module over a, and um, Al is so again it's a module over a space A. Uh, we still want Al to itself to be a F Leibniz quantum metric space. Okay, to mm -hmm. sort of we're going to use this to build. It's not used directly in the definition, but in most constructions, this is you use the actual L that you start with to build this thing called the D norm. So we have a norm called the D norm, uh, which is now this is our like L semi norm for. Um, or Lipschitz seminar for the module situation. Um, and as, as we'll see in the next examples, we'll see like it's basically built from L and then just then you just want to capture structure from the Caesar algebra. Um, anyway, and the goal again is, you know, the goal behind the scenes is that I want, again, eventually, I want distance zero. I want to, you know, Latchamere wanted to build, I mean, Latchamere built a distance between these so that you get a module isomorphism, a C-star, which, which I'll specify later what that means on a, on a later slide, but you can guess, kind of guess what that means probably. But So this structure is is here for the purpose of that, for to create a modular propinquity where distance zero gives you the same C-star algebra, the same module um, structure, and also somehow intertwines the L and the, uh, this D1. Okay, so that's kind of what these definitions are doing. You want... You want it to bound the uh, module norm, which is just the standard norm built from the um, inner product, the the a valued inner product. Um, and then you also want this set to be compact, which is related to the quantum metric structure, as I mentioned before. Um, one way to show metrization of the weak star topology is you quotient by the scalars, and then you show that the unit ball is compact. So this is this is the motivation for that. Um, and then here are here are the Leibniz properties. Again, this is more about making a statement. These things you don't have to memorize the definitions, but these are the things that capture sort of the. So A is in your the subordinate element, elements. So omega is in your module. You want to sort of have some condition that um, sort of preserves the multi the module action. Um, and here as well, you want to take care. Of what are, what about the inner products? Right? What about the A valued inner products from our module? How do we sort of um, capture that structure all within this new, you know, <clears throat> center structure? Um, yeah. Okay, so um, <clears throat> uh, here's the first example, just to get an idea of what one of these D norms could be defined as. Um, and so we, <laughs> so, uh, me and Zhao Wei, Zhao Wei Yu is a, is a student here at Pomona College, a very, uh, uh, Excellent student. Um, it was a pleasure to work with her. Um, she's graduating this year. Um, and um, anyway, so we proved that um, that if um, we have a norm close to set, and again, the idea is I want to show that if ideals converge in the felt topology, then they converge as modules, as quantum vector bundles in the modular propinquity, which I haven't defined yet, and I won't define. I will just state the result. Um, so first I need, you know, ideals to be quantum vector bundles. So the structure is take a subset of ideal, norm close to sided ideal, uh, a, the induced metrized quantum vector bundle uh, of this ideal or one that we found, that we defined, defined and proved it was such, um, is given by where the, the, the inner product is just F G star, you just multiply again, this is a standard, and your product to put on uh, a module. Oh, well, the mod if the module is just acting on the base on the A itself. Um, in this case, I think this is a standard construction for ideas. Uh, yes, Tomac. Yeah. 
Yes, I have a question about this theorem. Uh, usually, if you think about this uh, matrization of, of, of subspaces, you are talking about the quotient of the algebra module of the idea. Now we are metrizing the idea itself. Yeah, okay. Um... Yes, uh, then I wonder, uh, is then the, uh, a relation between this uh, kind of distance or Lipschitz seminal and, and uh, the distance between quotients? Um, yes, and, and now I, so that's kind of what's happening with the felt. So the felt topology is actually can be described as your sense, if your, your ideals converge, if, if your the quotients norms converge for every element. So for all elements. So, um, and so in some sense, and that is actually, that's key to us proving that these as quantum metro, metro quantum vector bundles converge in the modular degree. So um, it is sort of the structure of the quotients converging like point-wise the, in the quotient norms um, that's getting us there. So that's the relation I would say that we have, but as far as uh, anything else, I don't know um, about the relation. And I must okay. fail I'm terribly sorry. Uh, another. Sorry, I am also a little bit confused since you are taking an ideal in C of X. So everything is commutative. Therefore, I would suspect that uh, this object should correspond to something which can be constructed purely classically. Yes? Yes. So what kind of object? How to think about these objects? So, I mean, that would be. Um, so the ideal then would be some non-unital community of C-Shell algebra. Um, I, I just haven't thought about too much with it. I mean, but yes, and then in this case, the ideal would be C0 of... Um, an open subset. An open sub, yeah. So then... Um, okay, so, that's... Complement. so each ideal is given by some closed subset. Mm -hmm. I would be C0 of the complement of that closed subset in X, um, where uh, the ideal is just a functions vanishing on the closed set. Yes, um, so so there is no classical vector bundle in this story, yes? Uh, no, no, there's, yeah. Um, at least I don't know of any. Um, I mean, uh, well, one of the motivations for, um, I'd have to look at the example a little more closely, but uh, for these D norms, which I forgot to mention, also thanks for your question, um, is they come from, if you're looking at uh, like a compact Ramonian manifold and you're looking for uh, continuous functions on it, uh, the D norm, one way to construct the D norm is using the, um, I think the term is a connection um, from the differential structure. Um, so, but that's, right. that's again, that's in the, again in the case of continuous functions on compact Ramonian manifold. So, yes, but in order to have a connection, you, you would like to have some vector bundle in the commutative setting, yes? Right. Yeah. So, the vector so, bundle is, is absent as far as I understand. So, in other words, let me put it in other words. So, uh, even uh, restricting to the commutative world, still in this uh, uh, in the sense of this being a metrized quantum vector bundle, uh, the this is something richer, yes. You can uh, have something which is purely commutative, as you describe, but yes. still it co it does not correspond to to a classical vector bundle, yes. Uh, no, as far as I know, no, and and that well, this is um, this I would have described. A, like this is the question. Like this is something that I definitely need to look into. Um, but as far as this the definition goes, um, no, there's there's nothing. We're not using anything classical vector bundle at the moment. Yeah. Well, and just a very quick sanity check. I mean, when I have an ideal uh, norm close to the usual sister ideal in a sister algebra, I somehow don't believe that it always might must be finitely generated projective over the sister algebra as a module. Usually, it's not even. If, forgetting even about is it of infinite rank, yeah. First of all, right. Yeah. But even yeah. if it's of oh. infinite rank, it's very rarely uh, projective. Voila. Yeah. So, so, so that's why I don't understand why on earth call it a quantum vector band. It's better not to. <laughs> <laughs> I would. Uh, yeah. You can uh, direct your questions to. Uh... Uh, uh, Frederick Latermeyer on the uh, the terminology of. Uh, oh, so he is guilty. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's his. I mean, this is the uh, metrized quantum. Yeah, this is his definition. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
So we're, we're calling this that because it satisfies this definition. So, um, yeah, yeah, I understand because you, you look as, at an ideal as a Hilbert module. And here, yeah, Hilbert module, yeah. and then you can, yeah, this is the D norm. So here it's just, you can take the supremum norm of F, the, the, the C star norm on C of X, and do the Lipschitz semi norms of the real and imaginary part. Yeah. Um, and this gets us a, um, whatever this is, a metrized, like it satisfies this definition, not a, um, vector bundle yeah explicitly no, it's not explicitly it's some vector bundle um yeah um cool um yes okay um so ideals of af algebras so now let's see what what you know so again we need these to be these metrized quantum vector bundles so putting aside protests of the name, uh, <laughs> like we also need the AFK. We also need for the AFK ideals to be also quantum vector bundles. Things get a little bit messier there. Um, so this is just reminding us the structure that we had here. We had the L seminorm was this sort of um, you know control of the distance of elements from. So for example, if you are in a unit ball of this thing, then your your projections are converging at the rate beta then um, to your element A. So, uh, so how do we build a metrized quantum vector bundle from this? Um, so the issue, so to prove that, it would, so this, so you kind of want to do the same thing you did here. Again, this is a standard construction in like in Lachrymeria's paper. You kind of just, you attack on the C star norm along with your, uh, so like you have a C star norm here, you have an L semi norm, the D norm is usually the max or some sense. Uh, of course, there's more complicated examples, but a standard construction he says in that paper is take the max of the C star norm and the L semi norm. And that's pretty much what we did here. We had to take care of real and imaginary parts, but that's essentially what it is. And that's kind of what we want to do in the AF case too. We have the C star norm and the L semi norm. However, um, so if I just took these two things, I would actually get a metrized quantum vector bundle. Um, like I wouldn't, and again, the inner product is still the same inner product as the previous slide. Like we're doing the standard construction there. Um, we're in the L, L beta here. Um, but the question then is why is this here? Um, this is here because eventually, so I also get that these are also metrized quantum vector bundles, again, with this construction essentially borrowed from Lachmarier's ideas in his paper, just take the max of these two things. So you get the you get the i's and the i, where i n is defined up here. It's just the intersection of your ideal with a n. Um, our goal eventually, so I, I, a sequence of ideals converge is sort of, as I mentioned before, we, again, we're showing that these infinite dimensional spaces converge, these ideals converge. I'm probably going to want to reduce down to finite, finite dimensional approximations. So here are the finite dimensional approximations. Um, so I eventually, once I mention what the modular propinquity is um, or the main result for it, I eventually want these modules to converge to this module. I want these I want these to actually be finite dimensional approximations, uh, these to be finite dimensional approximations for this in the modular propinquity, okay? Uh, sorry, Conrad, okay. Uh, yes. it, it looks to me uh, this condition in the middle, that it's like some kind of D'Alembert condition. So oh, uh, oh, let me, I, I've been actually wanted to ask, I, I, this is what I'm excited about this talk too. I'm wanted to ask if anybody knows. So D'Alembert, okay. Yeah. And 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 how about if you would replace it by a Cauchy-like condition, like the square, the nth square root of beta n converges to zero. N square root. Because typically it's a stronger condition. So it should also imply what you, I don't know. Okay. No, I, I we, we also just didn't even know D'Alembert. Like, I, like in this talk, I'm actually like, I want to ask, so you've already answered my question because mm -hmm. the, so two things arise. So again, this, if I just had these two quantities, these would be, this would be a quantum, a metrized quantum metric bundle. This would also be a quantum metric, a metrized quantum metric bundle. But the issue was that the conditional expectations have nothing to do. They don't care if you put elements from your idea. Like if you put, put element of your ideal on here, you might not end up in IN. Okay. Mm -hmm. So here we devised, we realized that in order to sort of our finite, in order to get our finite dimensional approximation to work out, we also need to make sure sort of that we end back in the ideal. So this is what this added condition is here. It's sort of to 
it, it, it it's not very clear how this is happening uh, maybe on on this on the slide here but it, this equipped with this equipped with this which again is using conditional expectations gets us finite ventral like without this well, without this i'm not going to get finite ventral approximations in in i'll get finite ventral approximations in an if i just had this but i don't need that i need finite ventral approximations in in so so this and all this is doing is you take the standard i mean this this it's not surprising where this comes from this is just the standard um standard um approximate identity for your ideal right uh -huh. you just take the the I intercept A n is finite dimensional, so it's unital, it has its own unit, and then this is your approximate identity. So we're just using the approximate identity here to sort of get approximations so, to so that our E n's are not just getting approximations in A n, but also in I n. So um, this is why this weird thing is here. And then in the process, uh, again, it's it, this is all preparing for showing convergence of this to this in modular propinquity. In the process, we had to add this condition. So um, we had beta n converging to zero, um, got us that we had a quantum metric space, but to get a quantum vector bundle with this structure, we had to also add, not just beta n converging to zero, we had to add this condition. Um, Sorry, I think that this condition is much stronger right. than the condition that the n square uh, n sorry n fruit of, of beta n tends to zero. So the uh, Cauchy criterion is stronger since uh, this this is the the assumption of the Cauchy criterion. So okay, so this condition is stronger. Yeah, yeah, this condition. Yeah, and uh, and for example, it's I mean I'm sure you all believe, but I've had questions about is you know give an example of a sequence. Uh, so one over n factorial, for example, satisfies this in case anybody was. <laughs> So that's one over n factorial is a is a sequence um, that goes to zero and satisfies this. So it does exist. No, no, but no, none of you were asking that. I was just I'm prepared from previous experience. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a very strong condition. Um, and I'm, I'm you. I, I was going to ask what kind of a condition it is. Piotr already Piotr already gave us you know, gave me Dale and Barry and Koshi. So thank you for that. So now I can. Look through that to see. So now, what I'll do after this talk is probably look back at the proof and see, like, okay, how are these? Uh, like, we know we, you know, in doing the proof, we realize we needed such a condition, but maybe more directly and sort of understand like why this condition is arising. Um, so, thank you for giving me names to look up and conditions that may make it more clear where this is because we just required this because we needed it. Um, <laughs> but um, anyway. Um, so, yes, uh, so again, I want to, the goal is to show this, this converges to this, and then use that to show that if I have a sequence of ideals in the felt topology, then omega sub i converges, uh, omega sub i n converges to omega i, uh, not i n, but sequence of ideal. Um, but the idea is we will need to use these finite dimensional approximations as well. Okay, so... Again, the modular propinquity is quite an involved definition. And gamma should be capital gamma. I apologize for that. Um, you forgot so the backslash. Yeah, backslash. I forgot the backslash. Yeah. Um, so is a metric up to full quantum isometry. So I'll mention what that is later uh, well, at, at the end of the slide. Um, so this is a metric up to full quantum, a class of metrized quantum vector bundles. And here's what full quantum isometry means. So if I have two, so capital omega, capital gamma, metrized quantum vector bundles. Full quantum isometry is committed by paramaps. So theta is a star isomorphism between your C-star algebras. And phi is a bijective linear map between your modules such that um, it, together, theta and phi preserve the module structure. And we also require that phi preserves the the C-star algebra value inner products. Um, and furthermore, we need to also capture the quantum metric structure, meaning that data still has this condition with the L semi-norms, but now the uh, D norms satisfy this condition with the, the map between the modules. So it's so, a so large way to prove this. So, but the uh, modular propinquity is a much more involved construction than the um, gramma positive propinquity itself. Um, there's just so much more structure you need to capture. Um, so sorry, but you do not require that this uh, 
A and B valued in the products are somehow related, yes? Or does it follow from this condition regarding D? Um, I mean, I do require that the five, I guess I didn't explicitly state this, like five preserves the- oh, Okay, okay, yeah. it's written. It's it's written. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah. I, I was focusing the formula, so sorry. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was, yeah, I was running, out, running out of room on the slide, <laughs> but yeah. Okay, okay, um, that's right. Yeah. So yeah, you get a very, like distance zero is very nice in this case. You get everything you need and more. Well, this is what you need. Distance zero if and only if this happens, right? Um, so it's necessary and sufficient. Okay, so um, yeah. So then uh, we're first able to show, and again, this this is, a, I, I highlight this again, the this condition on the sequence. Mm -hmm that the we do have finite dimensional approximations like the you know because capital i is the closure of the union of these ins right so one thing we wanted to check first is that so this is nothing with felt topology and this is just these ideals converge i n converges to i in the modular group um yeah and again this this condition here was to to make sure our approximations provided by the projections actually ended up being in back in i n not just in a n um yeah and so we get convergence there um and this is again this is so back in the just the just the af algebra case um this was less than or equal to beta of n but now looking at these ideals as modules it's less than or equal to something a little bit uh more involved but it involves this condition here um but the point is that even though it involves this condition it's still something we can sort of uniformly approximate like if, if for any ideal i get this is less than or equal to like two times this, I think it's like two times this plus beta n or something. Like we get um, a condition here that um, gives a sort of a uniform, like if I have a sequence of ideals now, I'll get a uniform approximation by the finite dimensional. If I just use a fixed beta um, sequence. Um, yeah, so now the felt topology. So again, I we wanted to, here again, this, this was not converted. This is just these, I, I ends converge to I. Okay, but again, I want to now. I want to take a sequence of ideals in I, right, um, and show that those converge. If they converge in the felt topology, then they converge. Okay. Um, so I mentioned again earlier, based on a question, um, but I'll just uh, reintroduce it again. Now that I now now that it's written down here. So in 1962, Bell introduced a natural compact Hauser topology and the set of ideals, norm close two sided ideals. Uh, what do you mean by operator field? So, so the so the uh, uh, so it was sort of a precursor to um, continuous fields of Caesar algebras. Um, okay. okay. Look at the Sanchez sixty two paper. It's sort of a, so it, yeah. it was it was uh, the paper didn't involve Caesar algebras. So it sort of was a, a precursor to yeah the eventual definition of a continuous field of Caesar algebra. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then the paper is called, the, I believe, The Structure of Operator Fields. Uh, so you can find that paper. Um, so, however, as I mentioned before, the Fell topology is like, so Fell has also a 1961 paper. Actually, it's funny, the 1961 paper is, I think I have it backwards. The 1962 paper is operative fields. There's a 1963 paper where he introduces this this general construction of the felt topology, meaning given any topological space, mm -hmm. felt introduced topology on the closed subsets. Um, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah. And so what to, to, so it's funny, it, just, it got published afterwards. <laughs> like the 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 general topological paper, the point set topology paper that he had was published after the operative field paper, even though he used the um, yeah, it's just funny how that worked out. Um, but anyway, but yeah, um, but as brought up earlier, the felt topology is used in a lot of applications, not just ideals of Caesar algorithms. Okay, so yeah, so this is the sentence that he introduced the topology um, on closed sets as a topological space. And he applied to the specific case, look at the Jacobson topology and primitive ideals. And thankfully, the primitive ideals are in one to one correspondence with the closed sets in the Jacobson topology. And the norm closed two sided ideals. So uh, 
you know, we just use the uh, initial topology given by the one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, uh, yeah, and then we get the felt topology. <clears throat> okay, so um, yeah, and here's a very, again, this is back to uh, what Tom Mac asked earlier. Um, one can actually characterize this topology by convergence of nets. So let A, B, C, so algebra, a net of ideals converges to an ideal on the felt topology I, if and only if for every A, the quotient norms converge. Um, so the sort of pointwise convergence or weak convergence with the quotient norms as maps. Um, and then like in the paper, the night to sort of get back to operator fields. So basically he used these on kernels of representations, um, kernels of homomorphisms were the ideals. So this is the relation to the operator field setting, um, which is, so we had sort of this, convergence of the uh, representations provided by the convergence of the kernels in this topology. Um, it's probably the extent of what I remember from that paper, but yeah. <laughs> but he does prove it, doesn't prove this result explicitly, um, but it's not too hard to gather from the work. The, the net of the ideal convergence of nets, so mm -hmm. it's not too hard to deduce from his uh, work. <clears throat> yeah, so then, uh, is there a question? No, 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 no. Yeah. Um, so then, yeah, then then with this structure, so this is just stating the result, was that if we took, so this is the notation I use for ideals of the C child, but just ideals of A, <laughs> for the norm-closed two-sided ideals. Again, um, like in the paper we put, for the rest of the, whenever we said the word ideal in the, in, for C child algebra, we mean norm-closed two-sided ideal. Um, yeah, so this, we proved this is continuous. Um, and um, with respect to the felt topology in the domain and the Brahma positive group, including the coda name. And just to be clear, the beta is fixed for every ideal, like fix a beta, like we're using the same beta for the L beta. So it doesn't matter if I plug in ideal I here, ideal J here, I'm using the same beta here. So that's, and that's what's giving us the uniform approximation by the, like over all the ideals of the finite dimensional bits, which is the standard. This is just, a, this is a standard, uh, and in just in just proven results in general about quantum metric spaces or or quantum vector bundles or whatever these structures is finite dimensional approximations are uh, are sort of the key. Um, and this was first introduced by Riefel and uh, uh, when he showed the not uh, the quantum the non commutative Tauri converged. Um, he sort of uh, established a general condition for finite dimensional quantum metric spaces to converge. Uh, um, a sufficient condition for finite dimensional spaces. And so then if you just get it, you just get it. So it's just triangle inequality. If you get an uh, approximation of the finite dimensional and then uh, the infinite dimensional with the finite dimensional and have convergence at the finite dimensional level, you use Riefel's criterion for that. And, and then if it's uniform enough, then you get your boost up again by the triangle inequality to the infinite dimensional spaces. So, um, so that's, so since the beginning of, uh, non-commutative analogs to ground Hauser distance introduced by Riefel, he did provide this tool that's still used to this day. Like this is the main tool. Get a get finite dimensional approximations and then show use Riefel's criterion for convergence at the level of the finite dimensional approximation. Um, in this case, we don't have to use the full structure of that to do that, but the philosophy is there. Get get to finite dimensional approximation. Um, so so this is the AF case. And then uh, here is the C of X case. So we also got the same result. If I have ideals converging in the felt topology, um, I get convergence to this. Um, I get the convergence of the associated um, metrized quantum vector bundles. Um, uh, so let me, like, we have we have more time, right? Yeah, yeah. Have, and and uh, wait, so, so is this theorem if and only if, or just one way implication? I um we haven't looked into that too much. It, it, usually these theorems are one way, like uh, mm -hmm. in general, just because the structure of the modular propinquity is so involved that it's really hard to get like um, to go backwards. I mean, there's there is there is the there is the one case where you, that we know you can, and that's in the case of which is probably why you're asking it here, right? In the C of X case, just looking back at quantum metric spaces, if I have X. Xn converge to X in from Hauser distance, that's if and only if C of Xn converges to C of X, right? That's the homeomorphism onto its image that the quantum propinquity has. 
but that's the only result I know. Um, and then Reef will originally prove that actually. Um, that's the only result I know where you get if and only if for convergence. Um, maybe this one does because again, it is the C of X case. So, uh, but that's good. That's a good question. It's definitely something mm -hmm. I want to look into. Um, yeah, so I might actually pull up my tablet here. I just want to sort of get an idea, like give a little idea about the, how the proofs are working. Um, uh, I'll just be short, short description. Like, like I'm not going to go into the full detail. Um, in particular, the C of X case is is nice. So I'm actually going to connect with my, so I'm connected to my tablet here on my share screen here. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing on this screen. Okay, and then I'm going to share on my tablet. Mm -hmm. I'm also going to pull up the paper real quick. Um. I mean the idea. I don't think I got the paper, the slides too, just to reference it back. Um, okay. Uh, sorry, my slides aren't loading on here. Of course, I had them loaded, and then. <laughs> Always technical difficulties. Um, it should only be a minute though. Okay. Okay. Now, now it's it was a blank screen on the PDF. Does that happen? Here. Okay. Ah, yes. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is everyone seeing slides in the, yeah. The slides on the uh, blank screen here? Yes, correct. We have it. Yeah. Okay. So the idea, basically in the end, and, and this is again, a general, so I like to kind of present a general idea of how just convergence in any quantum graph has a distance any quantum, any non-commuter analog or gamma Hauser distance, a lot of it reduces to just looking at, not reduces, but the key thing you want to check is how far are the the, the unit balls of the um, uh, of the D norm or the L semi norm. So, for example, here, like the main goal here, and also I mentioned like how felt convergence is working in the um, AF case. It's a very nice condition. So here to get to get this result, all we did was just we found. So again, we're all living in the same Caesar algebra. We just found that in the Hauser distance, the unit balls in the uh, the D norm. So if I have like if I have two ideals, if I have a sequence of ideals converge into I, all we had to do it reduced this. There are there are some added details, but again, I just want to see. So the A and I N such that D I N, sorry, I added this superscript. Oh, actually in this case, I'm actually, I should specify. So here I'm just looking at a single ideal and then we have the I N sub N is the finite dimensional approximation. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm just trying to get this result here. Mm -hmm. uh, and so all you have to do is look at, yeah. That this is the Hauser distance between us, and then not the correction is D here. This is just the C star norm. And the other set being just the same thing with all the subscripts. Um, I'm not showing the specific calculation, but basically we just showed this goes to zero. Um, and this is where you get, and uh, I'll, again, uh, aside from details, this is where you actually need this. Um, into there. And this is, again, this is why I've been saying, also I mentioned this, I do need an approximation back in IM. And this is, you know, if you look more details in the paper, this is why this quantity is needed. The conditional citation is great at giving you approximations in AM, but again, um, 
any approximations in I n because this is what we're actually calculating here. I actually need an approximation in I n. Um, so that's kind of an idea there. Um, but what about the structure? Now I want to show a sequence of ideals converged. So, um, so this gives us our finite dimensional approximations. And again, this is some. These are again. The, I don't show the full quantity here, but this is a sort of uniform in beta. Like if beta is fixed, I, I get like for any ideal, then this is just going to be less than or equal to something on the order of beta n. Um, but what about sequence of ideals? So here I'm going to mention a result that you can show. Um, so we have this net convergence of ideals, but in the case of AF algebras, you'll say you have a sequence of ideals i n converging to some i in an AF algebra A. These converge in Fell topology if and only if. Um, so first you consider these i n's as each i is a sequence. So i you can consider as a sequence of ideals. I intercept A1. I inter right, this Sorry, Conrad, uh, I superscript N is the same as I subscript N, right? Uh, no, it's not. So here I'm here I'm just taking, so superscript is just like I N is an ideal. I right, so you take its what? Power? No, it's a sister algebra, so it's the same. Well, I don't want to take, uh, maybe I should like, the notation is just, uh, the subscript is when we look at the finite dimensional, so. Mm-hmm. Okay. This, this is notation. Okay. Is an, an ideal... Okay. In A, yeah. Mm -hmm. Each I am. And I capital I as well. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the idea is what's nice about the felt topology and convergence in the AF algebra is if we look at each of these ideals as just um, the sequence, a sequence of their finite dimensional approximations. So for the I am, so this may clarify the notation or make it worse. We'll see. Mm -hmm. So I view each of these ideals as just like the sequence of so and again I2 is just I I intercept A2. Yep. And this one's the same. This is I N intercept A N. Intercept A2. Right. So you, these I, these converge if and only if I it's I n viewed as these sequences converges to I in cylinder set topology. Well, I'll mention what that means because that might not be a common term. Cylinder set topology. Meaning um, I n is converging to I if and only if for longer and longer initial strings, these are equal. Like the I1 equals I n1, I2 equals I n2, I3 equals I n3, and so on. So Bell topology convergence in the AF case is equivalent to just sort of these, the, the sequence of ideals are sort of zippering up from the bottom. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and this is related to things like cylinder set topology, or maybe another term that might be familiar is bear, bear convergence uh, in the bear space or convergence in the canter space. Like if I have a you know, sequence of zeros and ones, it converges in the canter space in the usual topology in the canter space. Um, well, the product topology, uh, uh, if and only if the strings of zeros and ones start agreeing on longer and longer initial segments. Um, so yeah, so the felt topology is a really nice characterization in there. So therefore, this is how we're using finite dimensional approximations. Essentially, as as ideals converge in the felt topology, um, we already have the finite dimensional bits are getting closer and closer to the bigger ones and the finite dimensional bits are just spaces are just equaling eventually so i'm able to use the triangle inequality to get down to the finite dimensional ones and those are just end up being equal 
and then I can boost up to the infinite dimensional one again. Um, so yeah, so file convergence, file quality is very nice in the AF case. Um, okay, so that's kind of, that's the story of the AF situation, mm -hmm. a summary. So the C of X situation has also, so, so the moral of the story of this paper is, uh, we we just used uh, we utilize very nice concrete. Uh, if you have concrete, okay, we we found concrete realizations of the of the Fell topology, and that's what got our results. Like, um, so here's the the AF algebra case has a concrete, um, very nice concrete uh, description of the Fell topology. So another space that has a very nice concrete uh, description of Fell topology is C of X. Um, in particular, uh, first, given an ideal, so every ideal is of this form, right? So, well, I should just say there's, so if F is a closed subset of X, closed, so X is compact Hausdorff. So if F is a closed subset of X, uh, I can generate an ideal from that. Mm -hmm. Maybe it would generate, but uh, it's just elements of C of X. That X and F, the F, so F vanishes on F, little f vanishes on F, capital F, All right? So this is a one-to-one -one correspondence between close subsets. So then you can show all ideal, you can actually show any ideal C of X, non close two-sided ideal, well, two-sided is automatic, it's commutative. Any non close ideal is um, given by capital, and this is a one-to-one -one correspondence by Eurozon's lemma, things like this. So, um, but again, as I mentioned earlier, Fell first introduced just a topology on um, closed subsets of X. So maybe I would say C star Fell topology, Fell convergence of ideals of C of X. Is equivalent to Fell topology convergence of closed subsets of associated closed subsets. Mm -hmm. So that's very nice. If so, if I if I'm talking about convergence of ideals of the the, the C star version of Fell convergence of ideals of C of X, and for each ideal I just identify its capital F, its close its associated closed subset. That's equivalent to convergence, just of the felt topology on closed subsets of a topological space. Okay, Conrad, let me stop you here because this is very a good point to for you to elaborate. I mean, stop you not in the sense of finishing your talk, but stop you uh, at this thought. Because with equivalence, you see, when I look on the right hand side, all I'm talking about, the only structure I have is uh, the structure of closed subsets, right? And and, right. and 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 then I have a prescription from Fell how to topologize it is. Uh, mm -hmm. But on the other side, when you have the C star, I mean, on the way you have this F, G, H, what not. So what I would like to understand is what is the classical meaning of all that additional structure that you use to define the C star Fell topology and, and, and uh, how does it relate to anything classical? Um. Yeah, so 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 it really does just uh, reduce down to the net convergence. I mean, I forget the um, proof at the top. This this equivalence, but the yeah, the net convergence down here. So we do have that in the quotients. Mm -hmm. C star fell convergence is given by this condition. Ah, okay. So C star. I'm sorry. So my, my bad. My bad. So, so, so the C star fell convergence. It's just without all these extra fancy structures. Oh yeah, yeah. Things. This is not the module. Okay. Yeah, sorry. yeah. Sorry. No, no. Thank you for making. Yeah, yeah. This sorry, is not sorry. The... I, I confused it. Yes. Oh yeah. yeah, no, yeah. So, so this is yeah. This is where we don't get it. For, yeah. So yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Your question earlier. Yeah, I don't know about that being an if and only if, but um, okay. So then I want I want to talk about another equivalent. So in the in when you have m. When you have a compact metric space, XD, you get an extra equivalence. You have, uh, this is equivalent to Hausdorff distance convergence of closed subsets, of the mm -hmm. closed subsets. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so that's very nice too. It's that's equivalent as well. And this is our main tool. Because again, back with the same reasoning, same idea in the AF case, it reduces to comparing these um the unit balls mm -hmm. of our system. Okay, so um so basically I can reduce the convergence uh the unit balls in my dean in a, what we have to do is reduce the convergence in the C of X case to just the Hauser distance between the closed subsets. Um, but we have to, again, we have to use that to get back convergence somehow the functions. So here's a little picture of what's happening. So if, if I say, if I have two ideals, I, F and I, G, right? And F and G are their associated closed subsets. I should use dark, darker colors. Um, associated closed subsets. And let's say these are close in some sense in the Hauser distance, the, the close subsets back in the metric on X. Let's say those are close in some sense. Uh, so the picture is, but I want to get a statement about the, the unit balls in these spaces are close with respect to the denorm. All right, I want this to in, induce an, 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 a, a sort of approximation of functions. Uh, so the idea is the following, if, Let's just look back at intervals. I mean, this is just a picture of it. I mean, we, mm -hmm. we did this in generality for any compact metric space, but really it just boils down to the idea is that if F, if F and G are close, let's say F is like this, and G, let's, for the sake of simplicity, just overlaps. So G is like this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's say I have a function that vanishes on F, and I want to approximate that by a function that vanishes on G. Mm -hmm. just do this um <laughs> just do this and then and i guess I mean, again we're in a bigger space x x goes all the way out of here let's say mm -hmm. so f keeps going up and then you just do this and then you go there you go and the idea is that if f and g are close this gap is going to be small mm -hmm. that's all it is and uh we had to do that in general it's a lot trickier when you don't have intervals but we use things like exchange extension theorem. Uh, mm -hmm. We also have to uh, tweak values inside. And again, it, it's tricky using the Hauser distance. It's, and I, I don't want to simplify the trivialized result. It's really tricky using this quantity to try to get approximations of functions. But um, that's basically the idea. If these sets are close, so these sets are close, so like their distance would be just like this epsilon here. Uh, and also remember the D norm, like notice I'm making the same slope, right? So the idea is you might ask, why not why not do a function like this? Like this function would be closer, right? Yes, but I can't, exactly, yes. I can't increase the slope. Yeah, I, I can't increase the slope. But it turns out if F and G are close enough, who cares if you can't increase the slope? The sets are going to be close enough that this uh, green distance here is close. Um, yeah, so I think, so that's all I really wanted to say about the proofs of ideas, um, proof ideas of these. Um, and. Uh, I think I'll stop there for for their ideas and questions. But yeah, so here's the here's so our paper's on the archive right now. It's submitted, and then uh, yeah, and this is uh, the AF paper here. This is the modular propinquity paper here. This is just the Gromov Hauser propinquity paper. Refuls. This this is the first paper where Refull introduced uh, the notion of a quantum metric space, and then um, this is his non-commutative analog, which is the first non-commutative analog for. The Gromov Hauser distance that's existed. So, which, so this really started it all, um, this paper here. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, uh, thank you for your attention. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much. So, and now let's proceed uh, with questions and comments. So, any volunteers? Mark, would you like to comment or ask a question? No, not really. I I enjoyed the talk. I mean, going back to an earlier question about the the states, the pure states being dense. My mm -hmm. vague recollection, and I may be wrong about this, is that that's true for any infinite dimensional unital simple C star algebra. That mm -hmm. then its pure states are are okay. dense. I don't know. Uh, um, so you need simple. Yeah. Yes. If if, it, if it's oh, simple. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Richard? No, I'm okay. Thank you. No. Tomek? 
I have a question about uh, traceality of the state you demand in all your uh, theorems about AF algebras. Mm -hmm. Is it essential or you can, you um, can speak about some deviation from, for instance, for instance uh, what about KMS states? Uh, I'm not sure about KMS. I, I, I do know that um, the idea, so if given a faithful state, maybe not, not, not necessarily traceable, you can make uh, projections uh, he was using the GNS construction, the Hilbert space, but the issue is that they won't necessarily be conditional acceptations. They won't be uh, contractive in the norm. So, but the traceality gives you, at least uh, I'm, I'm certain that if you do have a faithful tracial state, you do get, you do get a, and also a trace preserving conditional citation. I'm certain in this case, I believe the faithful state case, you can still get uh, orthogonal projections onto the ANs. Again, AN are finite dimensional. So the, in the GNS space, the 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 L two of your faithful state, uh, a n is the same set because you're faithful and it's um, and you're finite dimensional. So, uh, so you can get something almost, but not quite conditional citations. And then we really need the the full power of conditional citations. We need the contractivity of the norm. We need the bimodular property. We need that it's positive. We preserve self modern elements, um, things like that. So, uh, but I'm not sure if there's something in between, like you know, the, or or something like KMS states. Um, I haven't looked into that, but faithful state, you can get close to something like this, but not quite what you need. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? I, I can make another uh, comment. Uh, I agree that the terminology of uh, quantum vector bundles is unfortunate, but I, I believe that uh, Latremelier's motivating example was exactly uh, a uh, Riemannian uh, manifold compact uh, with vector bundles with a connection, and he and he he showed that 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 his uh, his the structure that he, he was defining captures that that situation, uh, but but we now see it captures many other situations that that don't have any uh, vector bundles in the normal sense. Uh, ah, great! So this is a very important comment. Because I'm afraid that without this uh, work of Frederick, uh, Roger Penrose could say, well, these are the emperor's new vector bundles. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, but if indeed, so, that, so, so that's uh, really a pity, Conrad, that you skipped it, because the explanation mm -hmm. of, uh, of what motivated uh, Frederick uh, to, to, to give such terminology I think it's crucial. Okay, so yes, I'll, I'll, there is a paper. I'll include that in my next talk. Yeah, I'll include that in my next. Yeah, mm, thank you. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, Mark, so much. Uh, uh, Tomek, uh, I have a question related to this last comment. Um, so, if you have this connection, you can cook up. Uh, in the classical case, you can cook up this mm -hmm. uh, Lipschitz norm. My question is, uh, can you use some other differential operators like like Dirac operator, like like the Dirac operator on uh, related to the length function on the, on the group? Can you use uh, these things to 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 create uh, analogs of this uh, of this? Uh, let's say, um, Lipner or something like that on modules. Uh, Yes. Um, so, th so this is. Um, uh, I believe this is what uh, Frederick does in his. Uh, so he has a paper. So the modular propinquity is a paper where you introduced all these things, but also he has a paper about Heisenberg modules converging um, over quantum two tori. So, um, and I forget if explicitly spectral triples are used there, but I mean, I mean, he also says later now now results about spectral triple spectral propinquity, and he's using these this module structure as well. Uh, behind the scenes, um, but yes, uh, there are results related to uh, spectral triples and using the sort of um, non-commutative geometric structure there to, to get you uh, these denoids. Yeah, so I, I would look into yeah the um, the Heisenberg module paper. Mm -hmm. Okay, and yeah, thank you. And yes, I would like to ask about the following uh, things, since you mentioned these fuzzy spheres, which came, in fact, from, from the physics. 
I wonder whether there is uh, any interest uh, interest in such results in the physics community about this convergence. Are you aware of any? Uh, yes, uh, uh, but I may uh, ask if Mark wants to comment on that. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure. Or um, since since he's here. Uh, um, certainly the the matter of of uh, convergence of the uh, increasing sequences of matrix algebras mm -hmm. to the two sphere and 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 those situations of th there certainly is some interest in in the physics community. I, I, I think the problem is that this is this just agrees with a what they intuitively sort of knew all along and and uh, they, mm -hmm. they they feel and so so they they reference some of my papers just saying for, for, to, to to make things precise uh, go see those papers but they they don't really use it mm -hmm. and and my 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 very recently uh published paper in communications of mathematical physics does does uh, uh all uh, that same uh uh, setting the, uh, the 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 Dirac operators uh, that uh, one can put on the matrix algebras that converge to spheres and coadjoint orbits and so on, and I I don't know of any physics papers that are quoting that one. It wouldn't surprise me, but again, I think well, they might say that that's that's that's. Uh, they had what that the, it's what they already know the problem is in the physics literature there were at least three inequivalent proposals for uh, what the Dirac operators should be that that would then converge to the Dirac operator uh, on the sphere or or other coadjoint orbits so possibly that might be of interest that that in my papers I have one that mm. specifically behaves quite nicely but uh, I don't know. I mean, I, it's uh, certainly not anything that it, I, I don't think the subject has, has advanced enough so that it, they could use it to to uh, prove things that they don't feel they already know. Okay, I'm, I'm asking this question since uh, I'm interested uh, whether it has something to do with this uh, renormalization, which is quite mysterious in physics. But it somehow is in this flavor that, uh, after all, you are changing your, I don't know, algebra, whatever, and gradually the the picture emerges when you when you vary your your parameter. So I I, I think that would be a very interesting uh, direction to look at. I mean, in, in, in my general. Uh, impression is that in the in the quantum physics literature there are all sorts of wonderful uh, uh, theorems that are that are looking for uh, definitions and proofs uh, yeah. maybe, mm. uh, there's yeah. a rich mine of ideas there that mathematicians can can uh, have fun uh, making precise mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? I don't see any raised hands. So in this case, let us thank Conrad again. Thank you so much. This was a very enjoyable talk, yeah, very enjoyable you. topic. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'm quite convinced that Mark's comments saved the day because... Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, and I'll definitely uh use uh include that in my future talk yeah. so that's very, 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 very helpful yes. yeah. yeah okay so let me stop recording